did a few long snaps, and they said, you're going to do it. That's fine. You're it. You're our guy. And unfortunately, that game um, was not a really great game for Furman's team. They lost by something like 62 to nothing or something like that. <laughs> but when you lose 62 to nothing, what happens? There's a lot of long snaps. So Andrew Smith set the record for the most long snaps in one game. <laughs> so for, uh, he told me that story one night after work, and I love that story very much. And I love Andrew, and I just couldn't resist telling it tonight to get started. I should say one other thing. I'm here with Rachel Fox, who is the, one of the leaders of AEI's uh, college campus outreach effort. If you have a moment afterwards, you should introduce your tour to yourself to her. She's also a wonderful product of the South. Uh, someone from Alabama. I have been horrified, however, to learn, as we've driven across the South, that she's never heard of the drive-by truckers, or of Jason Isbell, or Justin Towns Earl. I hope some of you have. These are great Southern musicians, who my son introduced me to him uh, during his, due to all of them, during his four years at Swan, another school here in the South. So, I didn't get a lot of recognition of that, and I'm very disappointed, I must say. These are great musicians. Um, okay. Now, a little bit about me and a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Um, as uh, Matthew said, uh, AEI is made up of academics and very distinguished academics who write about public policy from the perspective that they have. And they're very good and they're very uh, in touch with public policy and with policy makers and former practitioners. So sometimes I say it's academics and has -beds. And I'm on the has been side. I spent 20 years in working in state and local government, working in the large programs that provide assistance to America's most struggling populations. And um, the first thing I want to say is just an introduction to that, is that it's important to understand the structure of poverty fighting in the United States. And the way to look at it is there are a series of large federal programs that flow down through the states and sometimes through localities that provide certain distinct forms of assistance. So HHS has an agency called the Administration for Children and Families. They run the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, and they run the Child Care program, and they run the Child Welfare program. Or they, they fund them, and they provide guidance and policy expertise, but the actual management of those programs happens in states and in localities. So money flows down, and it's delivered at the state and local level. I actually kind of like that. We are a big country, and there are benefits to having a uh, strong local, uh, local role in the implementation of these programs. But that's not the only one. There's also um, Medicaid, which is also run at HHS, which is our largest uh, program for poor Americans by far. Uh, that provides public health insurance. There's the food stamp program, which is run out of a separate federal agency, the United States Department of Agriculture, um, which runs the food stamp program. And there's also refundable tax credits for low-wage working Americans, mostly American families, that was run out of IRS. So it's complicated. It comes from a variety of sources. It's hard to understand. I think it's fairly well funded, um, and it provides an enormous amount of assistance through different channels to Americans who are struggling. So I, I give you that as background so that you can at least get a sense of where, where I'm going in, in the conversation tonight. Uh, the, 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 the second thing to know about poverty fighting in the United States, and this is very important to understand, and particularly for all of you, is that it's not all and only done by the government. There's a whole other side of the world that is the aspects of civil society, faith-based organizations, community leaders, people who work in towns and villages and cities, absent, outside of government, trying to help people in need. And these are, I think, uh, when you talk about funding, smaller, they're not as uh, often in the newspapers, but they do very, very important work. And so while my expertise is in the government programs, um, I'm aware of this other world, and I count on it. In a little while, I'll talk about how I view their role versus the government role. Um, so it's important to understand uh, that uh, background as well. So uh, having said that, the topic of the speech is, a, is you know, it's a little ambitious. I admit, and frankly, I'm not going to cover all of that in the comprehensive, intense way that it said, or even Matthew promised. But I, I put those, uh, that title up, if only for one purpose, which is to say that in my judgment, my observation of the way uh, poverty has gone, poverty fighting has gone in the United States, especially from the federal government perspective, 
is that there are key turning points in the, in the effort that people who study this should understand what happened at, during those turning points. So, the Civil Rights Movement is a key turning point in our efforts to help struggling Americans. There isn't any doubt about it. It's a generally positive story, and it resulted in a lot of really great improvement for our country. And I'll say a little more about that in a minute. The Great Society, which was kind of an, an extra thing President Johnson added on at the end of the 1960s and then went into the 70s, was another turning point, but it wasn't the Civil Rights Movement. It was an effort to increase the <coughs> economic resources provided to people who were struggling, and through what I would consider a growth of the entitlement state. The Great Society was about relieving poverty through transfer payments and through direct assistance. Uh, and they had the language, sometimes, of the Civil Rights Movement. But the language of the Civil Rights Movement, as applied to voting rights or civil rights, worked. I would suggest that the language of the Civil Rights Movement, as applied to economic issues and poverty, really didn't work. And, but that was a key turning point. A lot happened in Great some of which was positive, but not all of it. Then, in 1996, Bill Clinton came along, and after years of real frustration in the country about the failures of the Great Society programs to really move people, partly motivated by AI scholars like Larry Mead and uh, Charles Murray, who wrote really seminal works about the failures of the Great Society programs, Bill Clinton, a Democrat working with Republicans in Congress, passed the 1996 Welfare Reform Law. That was another turning point. And the turning point there was, after really talking about rights and entitlement, we moved to now talk about responsibility. And for the first time in modern time, the social policy or the federal policy said to people who were receiving assistance, we want to help you, but you have to help yourself too. You have to be part of the deal. There's a reciprocal responsibility, which comes from the government providing you assistance. You need to go to work. And that was the introduction of work requirements um, in the TANF program. And that was a key turning point. And that's when I joined uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the policy world when I went to work for Governor Pataki in 1995, right at the dawn of welfare reform. So I am heavily influenced by my experience in watching the implementation of a work-based welfare policy in a very liberal entitlement state like New York. And I would say it was enormously successful. It increased the uh, work rates of never married mothers dramatically from 40% to 65%. It reduced poverty and it broke down caseloads. Um, and it didn't have negative consequences for poor children. So you will note as I go through this discussion, you'll sense he's, he, he comes from a particular perspective and I need to be honest about that. I was part of the sort of foot soldiers of welfare reform in New York uh, during the late 90s and early 2000s. And then I, I say the presidency of Barack Obama because that is another turning point, but it really happened even before uh, President Obama was elected. Uh, here, in the wake of 9-11, President Bush uh, turned a little bit away from work-based and responsibility-based policy. He turned more toward transfer payments, partly as a deal with the Democrats so they would not uh, interrupt or uh, not support his efforts in international affairs in the war. And he was distracted. There's only so many challenges a president can take, take on. He was one that was very much uh, focused on the world affairs. And so I think we began to slip away from the responsibility uh, policies of welfare reform. And those only got, uh, that only got worse, or more so, under the po policies of President Obama, who, while he said he supported welfare reform and responsibility-based welfare, really pushed through some legislation that increased assistance in various ways without tying it to responsibility or work. And so I, when I think about the last 50 years, those are key turning points in public policy in the United States as it relates to struggling Americans. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about the Civil Rights Movement, only because um, I, 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 I'm I particularly, it, it illustrates the extent of why I'm in this business. So some people ask me, why? why? Why do you, you're a conservative, you're a Republican, why are you in the anti-poverty business? And the way I illustrate that is with this slide. Um, this is a, a, a panel that describes one part of my father's career in public service. Um, he was a small town lawyer in northwest Wisconsin in 1960, and he wasn't all that happy 
And he got an opportunity to come to Washington at the very end of the Eisenhower administration and go to work in the Civil Rights Division, which at that time was a very small part of the Justice Department. And the real movement hadn't begun yet. There were some activities, but things were not really taken off. And no one knew whether our country was really going to face up to the challenges of the Civil Rights Movement. And so he went there in, in May of, uh, in July of 1960, and he found, and this is a lesson for all of you, that you don't really know what's going on in the country unless you get out from behind your desk in Washington and go to the places where the problems are and talk to people. And by himself, he traveled to Haywood County, Tennessee, not, not very far from here, and he met uh, this family, uh, L.A. Perry of Haywood County, Tennessee, and he found that Mr. Perry had registered to vote one of the very few African Americans who had ever tried to register to vote in that part of uh, Tennessee, uh, on one day, and a month later, after farming on that property for 15 years with himself, his wife, and his six children, he was received a notice of eviction. And this happened to many, many families in Haywood County who attempted to register to vote. My father took this picture, took Mr. Um, Perry's affidavit, and filed that and a collection of others in one of the very first voting rights cases to be filed uh, in the South in the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and those cases, over the course of the 1960s, led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And the uh, significant changes, in part, led to those changes. Other things had a role as well, certainly. Dr. King, the kids, President Johnson, certain po politicians, Republicans in Congress, but the Civil Rights Division had a role as well, and that's the environment I grew up in. And so I saw this public participation in a major problem facing our country that led to positive change and that was successful. And when you grow up in that environment, you say to yourself, well, I think I'd like to do something similar, maybe in a different area, maybe in a different challenge, but I believe in, in the possibilities of government. Um, there's a lot more to say about uh, the story of my father's career, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but it is a great story. And um, at the end of his life, President Obama awarded him the Medal of Freedom, which was a, a very uh, great thing to do. Um, I, I also put up here a series of statistics, and there are a lot of them, that convey a message I want to convey. And that is that uh, we made significant progress and significant changes in this country that have led to big differences between the America we live in today and the America of 1955 or 1960. Um, these statistics have to do with voter registration and participation. African Americans voted higher rates than whites in Mississippi and Alabama now. There's a percentage of their population. Uh, life expectancy, approval of interracial mar mar marriage, black members of Congress, they're changed, the, 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 the statistics are, 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 are positive. Now we've got ways to go, there are other things we can do, uh, but it's not correct to say that we don't live in a different country than we had in 1960, and a better country as a country. And nowhere was I more struck by that than just down the road in Columbia, South Carolina this past uh, year, when I came to an event that AI's Poverty Studies Group helped to sponsor that was the Republican candidate's discussion of poverty policy in the coming campaign. And so all, most of the major candidates were there, not the ultimate winning candidate, but most of the other candidates were there. And so I wasn't struck by them being there or by them even talking about poverty. What I was struck by in South Carolina was that the governor participated in the discussion, and that was Nikki Haley, and the senator participated in the discussion, and that was Tim Scott. And the fact is that in 1965 in the United States, no one would have been able to predict that that change would have occurred. And uh, I think that we need to not be afraid, as some people have said lately at AI, to tell the story of America without embarrassment. The story of America is a positive story, not entirely positive, but there are aspects of it that distinguish us from the rest of the world. And one of them is that we tackled uh, this problem in our country concerning civil rights. We have further to go, but we've made great progress. So, um, uh, I've now, one last thing I want to say, I'm going to put the next slide up, and we're going to get to child poverty rates. And I'm going to discuss this in a minute, but don't look at that. Think, listen, just the next point I want to make is that after doing the civil rights uh, division work in 1967, 
My father, who was a Republican, was asked by Robert Kennedy, who was a Democratic senator in New York by then, to come to Brooklyn, New York, and take on a different challenge. And that was uh, tackling urban poverty in Bedford-Stuyvesant, which is a large uh, urban, we don't, it's funny, people don't use the word slum and ghetto as much as they used to, but these were, this, was a, this was a difficult neighborhood about the size of the city of Pittsburgh, right in the middle of Brooklyn. And so the schools were bad, no jobs, crime was high, uh, um, all of the measurements of success were not going in the right direction. And Robert Kennedy wanted to start in any poverty uh, program that was community-based. And it was, uh, they did some redevelopment, they brought in some businesses, they did some community-based efforts, and they made a little progress in the 70s. They made a little progress on a few blocks with a few businesses for a few people. But at the very same time, the large policies of the federal government were providing assistance, welfare assistance and other kinds of assistance, that were entitlement-based and not based on any kind of responsibility expectations. And notwithstanding the efforts of the small community-based organization, that influence and that effect overwhelmed what they were trying to do. And we went really backwards in the 70s and 80s and early 90s in our cities. And our city, the city of New York where I grew up, was almost bankrupt. Um, and uh, uh, that's when I said, there's the cause. That's what I want to work on. I want to go to work in poverty. So uh, from there, we've made some changes. We've made some improvements on responsibility-based. I'm not going to get into all the details of that. I'm going to skip to the present and now tell you um, a little bit about the way we measure poverty. So on the left is the official poverty measure. And here you'd see 18.3% in 1980, 18% in, in 2016, hardly any change, same number of children in poverty, pretty much a failure. That doesn't look very good. On the right is something we call consumption poverty, which factors in, in the calculation, all of the resources we provide to households through the earned income tax credit or food stamp benefits or other forms of assistance and measures what people actually consume or, or purchase with their resources in their household. And here, if you think of it as material well-being, we've made a lot of progress. We're down to 4.1%. You, know, 4. 4. you won't see that number very often in the newspapers. This is much more the headline number because this is the official measure. But that number really is a better measure of the material well-being of Americans uh, in need. And that tells, I think, a positive story. But what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that when we started out trying to help people in need, we didn't want to solve their problems merely by giving them more stuff, merely by providing assistance. We wanted to help them solve their problems so that they could earn their own success and make enough through earnings uh, or, and working to be part of American society in a positive way. They could be upwardly, mo upwardly mobile. And here, the official poverty measure is still not great. There are problems with it. But it does reflect that we haven't made as much progress as we should. So to me, that's the real challenge going forward. We've done a lot to provide assistance through the various forms of assistance we provide. We're not doing enough to help people earn their own success. The next slide shows how the consumption poverty rate, very great decline. The official poverty measure, big decline in the late 90s, flattens off and then goes up in the recession in 2007, and then it's become, coming down. Now, I should say that the year we're in right now, I think the official poverty measure will be the lowest it's been in the whole period. It, made, it, it, it reached a, a nice low last year when the 2017 numbers are it'll be even better. And why do you think that is? Because the economy is strong. And we'll get to that in a moment. So um, that's an important observation that I would like to make sure that you um, get some understanding of. Now, uh, this is another chart that I think all Americans should be familiar with. Uh, we're thinking about our economy and are thinking about what's happening in our country. This is labor force participation. That is people 25 to 54 who are either working or looking for work. And what do you see on the left for men? You see a long, steady decline. That's a problem. 
So in the old days, 95% of American men, 25 to 54, worked. Now we're down to something like uh, 88 or 87 percent. Uh, that's a big decline, and there are lots of factors for that, um, but it's not good because we don't have people working and earning. Uh, they're not contributing to uh, our economy. They're not as healthy, and they're not as good parents. They're not actually as strong, and most of all, they're more likely to be poor and not moving up economically. Women, very good story of growth, but look at what's happening lately. Down. There is a little sign of ticking up in both. I'm very hopeful that's going to continue in the next uh, year or so. That would be good, but we need to focus on this. This needs to be uh, one of our major challenges. Um, another observation I'd like to make, uh, get returns to the issue about the different forces in fighting poverty. So, remember I talked about government, federal, state, local, provides various forms of assistance, $800 billion worth of assistance, about 3 or 4% of our GDP. Maybe it could be a little more, uh, but it's not nothing. It's actually quite a lot. Um, but what government does well is transactions. Government is good at writing a check. Government is good at giving somebody a food stamp card, which they then can take and use to purchase food to supplement their budgets so they can afford more food for their families. That's a good thing. I don't object to that. But that's what we do. We write refundable tax credits. We provide Medicaid cards so people can have the security of health insurance and get their health care paid for. That's transaction. That's what the, the government workers can do. Uh, but they can't <coughs> do transformational activity. They can't help people uh, uh, determine that they have an a, a agency in their own lives. They can't help people really um, with the struggles that come with uh, a, a, a broken family or a um, uh, substance abuse or mental, mental illness difficulties. They can't help people get their life organized as well as civil society. So here's where I kind of call out to civil society, churches, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, rotaries. They need to be stronger and better at helping people transfer, transform their lives. Some are, but there are places where civil society is not as active as it should be. And, um, and there are places where government has crowded out some of civil society. And that balance, how we get both of those activities correct, is a challenge in fighting poverty and something that I focus on. Another observation I make is that um, there are three spheres. And here I will refer to the, the report that we handed out um, when I first came to AEI, one of the things we do in Washington, occasionally, is we try to see if people from different perspectives can sit down together and come up with solutions that they can both agree on. And in the, in the run-up to last year's presidential election, people from Brookings, which is another think tank, and myself and others at AEI, assembled a group of scholars who were prominent lefties, prominent liberals, prominent conservatives, well-respected in the field, um, but didn't always agree, equal number on both sides, and we put them in a room uh, once a month, or once every two months for about uh, 14 months. And we wrote a report. And if you want something that's safe, that's, <coughs> that's pretty straightforward, that's well accepted, that's a document to read about both the facts, where we are, and about what we, how we should approach uh, problems of poverty. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those things, but the main thing I want to emphasize is that as one of our members, David Elbert, who is the dean, former dean of the Kennedy School, said, people who think that it's all about family don't have it quite right. People who think it's all about work and economics don't have it quite right. And people who think that we can solve poverty with schools, they don't have it quite right either. It takes all three. And so I, I want to make sure that I emphasize that, 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 in, that in each of these three spheres, we need to make progress to help people move up. Family. Uh, it clearly plays a large role, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Work obviously does, and schools matter too. I am not an educational uh, education expert. AI has a whole unit on education. I recommend the writings of our scholars there, and I would particularly recommend a book that's just recently come out by Eva Moskowitz, who runs one of the most successful charter schools in America, called The Education of Eva Moskowitz. And it tells the story of a young woman, went into politics, liberal Democrat, 
uh, ran into the power of the teachers' union and the intransience of the ability to change the school system in New York City, and then really turned and said, I'm going to just start my own school. And she started, it's now the most successful schools in New York State of any kind are run by Eva Moskowitz, and they mostly serve poor uh, Hispanic and African American children. It's a wonderful book, it's a wonderful story about one person's effort to bring change in a very difficult environment. My point here, family, work, education, they're all important, and the report is built around those three spheres. A uh, couple more observations. So um, here's the, the, the where, where I really, where, what my experience in New York City running the food stamp program and the welfare program and the Medicaid program uh, led me to come to conclude about how those programs should be structured. And there are four themes. One, I believe in requiring work. So that means that if you come and ask for assistance, I believe the agency should say, we're going to provide you assistance, but you need to do something uh, as well. And that means you need to go to a training program three times a week. You need to volunteer at a soup kitchen. You need to work as a um, you know, as a as an intern at a at a uh, government office or in a in a um, not for profit, but you need to do something that reflects the discipline and schedule of work, um, and will provide you assistance. We'll obviously provide childcare, and we'll you know we're not going to ask you to do something you can't do and care for your children, but we're going to ask you to do something in return for assistance. And I actually think that should provide that theme of requiring some kind of activity should run through all of the programs for which we provide assistance. Because we're really not helping people if we just <coughs> give them the card and say, I'll see you in a year. And that's what we do a lot of now <coughs> with food stamps and Medicaid and other programs. So requiring work is important. Second, we need to reward work. Uh, and this is where I acknowledge the fact that wages are not always high enough to support a family. And that um, we can sometimes supplement wages with refundable tax credits, with public health insurance, with food stamp assistance, with child care assistance. We should fund and support those programs that reward work, um, especially work in jobs which pay low wages. Um, we'll talk, I'll probably be asked about minimum wage, I'll talk about that later. But when we think about our government programs, we want to require work and we want to reward work. The third is we have to be willing to talk about family. You'll see in the AI Bookings report, if you read it, the child poverty rate for children raised in single mother households is five times the child poverty rate for those in married couple households. Their involvement in the criminal justice system is higher. Their future welfare utilization is higher. Their performance in school is less strong. There is just an enormous amount of data compiled by left and right scholars showing how difficult challenges of raising a child on your own. And single parenthood is a problem of all races. More children are born to white mothers in the United States who are not married than there are to black or Hispanic. The proportions are higher in those two groups, but the, the, the number is higher for whites than the other two groups. Um, and that is a big problem if you're going to address poverty. Because children do not do as well if they don't have the benefits of two active and involved parents there for the long haul. Now, this can sometimes lead to people feeling as if I'm passing a value judgment or I'm imposing my values on someone. I assure you I'm not. I don't want to mandate anybody to do anything. They can do what they want. I understand that. But young people and we as a society need to know what the consequences and the difficulties are with the fact that a very high percentage of children are born into families outside of marriage. So we're up to about 40% now in the United States. That's a big number. It's rising fastest for white Americans. It is, for, for an audience like this, you should know, 95% of college graduate uh, women have children inside marriage. If you're high school education or less, it's 50%. So we have a gap there. And the gap is leading to having us really be living in two different worlds. It's not good for America. Uh, and it's something we need to be willing to talk about, honestly, with uh, young people especially. And in New York City, we did that. Mayor Bloomberg uh, 
authorized a public message campaign that was very direct in our efforts to reduce teen pregnancy by saying not about its consequences for the teenager's future, but about the consequences for the children's future. And um, uh, teen pregnancy has dropped quite dramatically in the United States, down about 70%. But the number of children born into single parent families is still uh, not come down very much. And it is a challenge for the families and for those of us who are trying to uh, alleviate uh, and reduce poverty. Finally, uh, and this is uh, particularly interesting now, um, welfare reformers and welfare policy people and people that care about poor Americans can't ignore the fact that the economy matters a lot. It's, it's, it's not a small thing when unemployment is below 4%. There are a lot more opportunities for people who struggle. And uh, we need to have policies that protect a strong economy, that nurture a strong economy, that promote a strong economy. What I found in, in, in my experience with people in the social welfare world, who I'm very close to and love dearly, is they pay no attention to this. They think it has no effect on their ability to help struggling Americans. And the fact is that's wrong, and it can be very damaging. Because if we pass policies or support policies that negatively affect employers, they will hire fewer people and will have a much harder time reducing poverty or helping people move up. So require work, reward work, talk about family, and promote a strong economy. Those are uh, the major themes that I think have been most successful um, in reducing poverty, and I found to be most successful in New York State and New York City. Um, so now I'm going to uh, stop there with those observations. It's not the comprehensive review of poverty fighting over 50 years that maybe the opening screen um, advertised, but it gives you a sense of some observations that come from someone who has worked in the business and is now trying to develop a poverty studies uh, team at AI that's promoting research. I urge you to go to our website, look at our, our writings, uh, and, and um, use them to inform your like, thinking on these uh, matters as we go forward. So I'll stop, and I hope I have some good questions. Ready? Fire away. Yes, ma'am. We got a microphone. Okay, so kind of thinking about Green Mill and your experience with going to different southern cities, how do you think some of your welfare reform initiatives can be passed on to Greenville when we don't have nearly as many resources and well-known figures here like Mayor Bloomberg in our town? Well, that's a good question. It is very true that uh, often when I talk in Washington about these issues, people will say to me, Robert, you know, it's very nice, but you're in New York, and New York has these resources and has this interest and has this sort of infrastructure, and that's a big advantage. But I don't um, really think that that ends the discussion. Uh, these themes that I'm talking about can apply to uh, programs that are, are very well, they, they are administered and present in South Carolina. The food stamp program is present and alive in South Carolina. It's funded, the benefits are funded 100% by the federal government. The administration is 50 or 55% federal government. Uh, South Carolina has the resources to run a more effective and more work-focused food stamp program. I believe that. And, um, and I, I've spent enough time with uh, uh, state officials from all across the country knowing that there is an infrastructure and a bureaucracy there that can be moved in that direction. So I don't really accept the premise that other parts of the country don't have the resources or ability or infrastructure to bring that kind of attention. Certainly anyone can talk about family. You know, you can talk about family you can send public messages. Government, state governments have those resources. Um, running work, uh, uh, rewarding work, what I mentioned about rewarding work, most of the rewarding work comes from federal assistance. The Earned Income Tax Credit is a federal program. So all you're wanting to do is make sure that runs well in South Carolina. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar, since I grew up in New York, I'm familiar with, with, with um, New Yorkers who don't have particularly um, informed or positive attitude toward the South. Uh, I've lived with it all my life. And uh, they're wrong. And one way that I can express to they're wrong is that, is that you know, if you were around Tim Williams, they would say that Medicaid eligibility rates 
or food stamp eligibility rates, and eligibility rates is percent eligible who are receiving, must be really low down there in the South because they don't really care about it anymore. The fact is Mississippi and Alabama's eligibility rates are quite high. People that are eligible are getting access to those programs. So it's not really true, given the way we support and fund these programs, that states don't have the resources. Um, now, economic development and tax base, that's, everybody's got to work on that. that. That is a local thing. Um, but, you know, uh, that's one of the, uh, you got to compete. you gotta, you got to fight for bringing businesses to your state. South Carolina, I don't know, what is the unemployment rate in South Carolina? Do you know what it is? It's 3.3. Yeah, it's 3.3. So, I mean, South Carolina can do that. New Hampshire is, New Hampshire, I read a story in the USA Today this morning. New Hampshire's unemployment rate is 3.5. Employers cannot find workers. So they now have set up a, a, an exchange where employers come to a fair that's only targeted at people who are recovering from substance abuse. So employers are so in need of workers that they are going to fairs where they can meet people who have struggled with substance abuse who they can hope to bring into their firms. That's a good thing. That can happen in lots of places. I, I should just say one other thing. Employers are really important. <coughs> Employers are really important at providing a way for people to earn a wage, get training, understand the disciplines of work, be part of a community. And I don't think um, I talk enough about this, and I don't think our country talks enough about the responsibility of employers to nurture uh, their employees. Um, and, I'm, and what I like about the current economic times is now they have to. And that leads me to one other controversial issue. <clears throat> Why would, given the, the tenor of our times and our current president, why would it be a particularly tight employment world right now Immigration. President Trump has said, and his team has said, that they are going to limit, and are limiting to the extent that they can, low-skilled immigration. That, in their judgment, not mine, but their judgment, is an anti-poverty initiative because it makes labor markets tight, it forces employers to reach a little further for employees, and pay a little more. And that can be good for um, lower skilled, struggling Americans who are here. And so um, I didn't, that's one of what I didn't have in the, in the charts, but immigration right now is a particularly interesting issue to follow because we have a president who believes that a more restrictive immigration policy is a good anti poverty policy. I have some doubts about that um, and, and I have some worries about that because if you restrict immigration to such an extent that workers can't, employers can't find any workers, they won't just hire more people, they'll just shut down. And that could be a problem. Um, and I have other issues with regard to sort of my sense and desire that our country be a country of welcoming to people from outside. But that's not the opinion of the current president and his team. Um, and so we'll, I'm, we're, we're watching that and studying that, and we're going to see what happens. Question two. Yes. So, um, so right now the tax uh, reform is a hot topic, and do you think that it's truly a middle class tax cut, or the controversy between if it's actually going to help? businesses and middle class to low income families? So that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it and you raised a, a group that I haven't talked about and I, I think it's important to talk about and that is the middle class. There is a feeling in the United States and I think this is justified that over the last 10 or 20 years people who are in the middle class and below, the lower middle class, people who've worked, who had a high school diploma but not college, uh, men often who've worked in industries that have uh, uh, dried up uh, are particularly struggling. And they are. Their wages have not risen and their incomes have not risen. And some of that struggle has led to um, 
some of the political populism that's gone on. There's no doubt about that. That group is not the group I talk about. And I, I need to be clear about that. I am an expert in people at the very bottom, people who are really struggling uh, generation after generation in poverty. And, and I'm not saying that to forgive myself, because this other group needs attention too. Uh, but I need you to understand that they have different challenges and public policy can approach them in different ways or not. And um, I tend to focus on the very bottom. The country is concerned about this other group right now. And there's maybe even a sense that in the past 10 years, our public policy has been overly focused on the very poor, because they're the most in need, it's justifiable, and not enough focused on this other group. Um, so as the tax bill went through, the president, uh, the, the Republicans were not so interested in a middle class tax cut. They were interested in tax reform that reduced business taxes and promoted a stronger economy and in that way would lead to um, uh, greater incomes, greater opportunities for all Americans. Um, but President Trump pretty much said when he came in, I I'm not for revenue neutral tax reform. I want a tax cut for the middle class because they elected me and I want to reduce their taxes. And so over the course of the legislative process, the bill has become not a revenue neutral tax reform bill that was intended to reduce business taxes. It's now become a, a large tax cut as well as a business uh, tax reform. And with some closing of loopholes to pay for some of it. Um, my view is that that step uh, it, it has, has brought big risks to this bill because I am concerned about our long-term deficit and debt issue. It will, if it passes, and I think it will, it will reduce taxes on households with children, single parent households with children and married parent households with children, up to pretty high incomes. Uh, in an effort to provide some tax relief. It won't amount to that much, and it will cost a, per family, but it will cost a lot. Um, the business tax cuts, I think, have a good chance of keeping the growth, the, the growth spurt that we're on going. But, you know, it's really risky when your plan, when we're at, this is the fastest growth we've had in the last 10 years right now. And they're saying we need still more when there are certain structural factors in our economy that lead some economists to say that's not possible. So um, I'm a little worried. Uh, I think uh, um, the politics in Washington have not led to a, a really solid bill. And um, uh, I think they're taking big risks. Uh, and now there's one saving grace. Uh, and one of the AI scholars, long time, very, very, very uh, prompt, successful economist, John Macon, who was there when I first got there, pointed out to me, and this is his belief, and I'm not sure, I know all economists don't believe it, but in Europe, they raise more revenue through a consumption tax, through a sort of national sales tax. And if we were to impose something like that, it would be a revenue gusher. I mean, it, it, it is a very efficient way to raise a lot of money for the government. That's why a lot of conservatives hate it, because they don't want the government to get that much money. But when we talk about the debt and the deficit, an argument could be made that if it really does get bad, the growth doesn't lead to us being able to pay for this tax cut, and the debt and the deficit is very high, we always have that. We can go to a consumption tax or a national sales tax It'll be more regressive. In other words, it'll affect everybody, including the poor, more than we currently tax them at the federal level. But it will raise a lot of money. And maybe that's true. I'm not an economist. My view is they're taking big risks. Yes? Yeah, I want to ask about something which you haven't really <coughs> touched on yet, and that's homelessness. To me, homelessness is an integral part of any discussion about poverty, and it's not just a, a symptom or an indicator of poverty, it's also a cause itself. Obviously, if you don't have a stable home to go back to every night, it becomes 
infinitely harder to both get and maintain a job. At this point, we are arguably the wealthiest and certainly one of the most developed countries in the world. And yet, especially compared to other similarly developed countries in Western Europe and Scandinavia, we still have such a high problem of homelessness. And cities across the country still struggle with it. So in, in your opinion, why is it that we haven't made as much progress on homelessness, and how do you think we can best attack that? So uh, I think you're raising a great point, and, and you're right, a very frustrating part of uh, public policy, and particularly frustrating for New Yorkers. Um, during the time that I was uh, working for Mayor Bloomberg, uh, the city grew rapidly. Uh, we went from, you know, we're up now eight and a half million New Yorkers, probably more. And our housing stock did not grow. And people came to New York from all kinds of backgrounds, rich people, poor people, immigrants. And they put enormous stress on our housing stock. And our ability to develop housing was not rapid enough to meet that demand. So part of the problem for us was we just didn't have enough, didn't have enough housing. And I think that uh, we needed to tackle that in a more aggressive way at lowering the cost of uh, development and permitting higher density housing in parts of the city that we had not permitted in the past. And under the current mayor, that's what they're doing. And the housing stock is rising. Now, we also have a right to shelter in New York. And so that anyone who comes and presents themselves on any given night to our offices is provided a um, you know, sufficient, not beautiful, but sufficient housing for them for as long as they need it. And, and can't find an alternative. So right now, I think out of eight and a half million people, we're about sixty thousand people are in emergency shelter, which is not you know uh, beds in a row and a, and a cafeteria. They are sophisticated, certified shelters, but they are emergency shelter. That um, had a downside effect though, because if you provide something as a matter of right, people will come and take advantage of it. And so I'm not so sure that we didn't have a little draw to shelter there. And we certainly did when we said to people who came into the shelter system, if you're here for a month and you still can't find housing, we're going to give you a rental subsidy that you can use to add to your own income to uh, bid up rent in apartments somewhere in the city of New York. That made people say, well, if I go to the shelter, if I'm there you know, for a month, They'll give me one of these vouchers, and I'll be able to go get an apartment. That does lead to people coming into the shelter. So that made was problematic. Um, now, that's family homelessness. So I think we haven't done enough job. We, our housing market, our housing policies are, are, are not conducive to allowing builders to build housing that's affordable. Now, um, and so I think that's one area where we can make some progress on. Now, there's another category of homeless, and those are single individuals um, who are often coming home from, uh, they face particular difficulties with either substance abuse or mental illness. And here again, I'm not sure that we've, we've done a good job in helping them get into shelter. But I will say this, um, we do provide, through the Social Security Administration, um, social security benefits for people who have a disability. And some people who are, um, uh, who you see on the street in some cities are not entirely absent of some aid. The question is, is the aid enough or is it delivered in the right way? And I think that we uh, could make a lot uh, better progress on that. I note that in Albuquerque, this does not address family homelessness, but in Albuquerque, the mayor there decided that, look, I'm just going to offer everybody who's out on the street and says they're homeless a job. Right now, today, I'm going to go up to them, I'm going to take a team of city workers, we're going to provide them with the tools or, the, or what they need to do something. And it often is uh, maintenance or custodial work in a government building or a government park. But at least he was making an effort to engage them in activity that was positive. I think that's a, a, a something that others should consider. Um, but I don't, I, so that's what I would say. It's, it's a hard one. Housing is too expensive. Um, and the forms of housing assistance we provide, or we do provide it, 
is often through tax credits to builders who build public housing in a very inefficient way and provide not very much housing. If instead we made it voucher-based and provided Section 8 vouchers at the targeted individuals at the lowest income, I think we could serve a lot more people. And we have a scholar at AEI named Ed Olson, who is the former chair of the economics department at University of Virginia. He's the foremost uh, scholar on this very topic, and I think that would um, make some progress. I, um, so I'll, uh, I think that's our slide. I think we can take one final question. Um, about the two graphs that you showed close to the beginning about the declining work rates among yeah. men and women, yep. um, what do you think are the causes of that? What factors are behind it? So um, on the men side, <laughs> There are uh, two scholars at Princeton, Anne Case and Angus Eaton, who happen to be married, who have written some papers um, that have been sort of broadly called the Deaths of Despair papers. And they chronicle some issues facing um, men, one of which is the drying up of jobs that used to pay higher wages, causing tension or, or stress in their households, because they are not willing, and, and one can understand why, to accept the lower wage that is offered to them in the economy that exists in their community right now. So if you go from a $19 an hour job and you, you come back looking for a job and the only thing you find is 10, that can lead you to say, well, I'm not doing that. And that can lead to you know, deciding to, to live with your parents or live with your girlfriend or, and take, apply for disability. And those things can lead to people staying out of labor work. If you ask them, uh, they often say that I have a health issue or I needed to take care of my family members. It's not clear that those health issues are sufficient to keep them out of the labor market, and it's not clear the extent to which they're really needed in the household. They may be. Um, uh, so that's one. The, the ravage of uh, the opioid epidemic is serious and a, and a significant contributor to this problem. Incarceration. Incarceration rates in the United States are, have not been good, and they've led to a lot of people who come home from prison and uh, have that added barrier to helping them get into the labor market. That's a problem. Um, so I think it's multifaceted, and in the paper that we wrote, Getting Men Back to Work, we decided to throw the whole kitchen sink at it and try everything that might work to uh, encourage men uh, back into the labor force. Um, uh, and on the women's side, that peak and then that drop off, I believe, uh, is partly attributable to, um, similarly for the men, this period of time when we've had our wealth, our social assistance benefit programs be more generous and less interested in engaging someone in the kind of dialogue that can lead them to go to work. Um, so it's just a fact. If you provide assistance and don't in involve an element of employment in that assistance, uh, people won't, will, their incentive to work goes down. Uh, and I believe in you want to always be, be making it clear that, that going into employment and then leveraging that employment with assistance that makes work pay is a more effective way to help people move out of poverty. So uh, those are some of the, uh, the factors involved. Well, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Please join me in giving Mr. Dora a round of applause. I would like to remind you, if you would like to learn more about AEI or our future events, we have an email sign-up sheet right outside the door. You can put your contact information on as you leave. Thank you again. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, that's Absolutely. Fantastic. Yes, we're going to dinner. We're going to dinner. We'll make sure we get everywhere. Got to go somewhere. Yeah, go on, go. Go socialize. That went pretty well. I thought that went pretty well too. I was encouraged by the people. Absolutely. People were lively.